my Facebook. Uh, hello, Facebook audience. God bless you, and hello, Periscope audience. There we are. All right, so the reason you're seeing me tonight is because tonight is the second Thursday of the month. On second Thursday nights, I come on with a series called No More Genies. Okay, it's a series called No More Genies. And if you understand, or if you don't understand what I mean by that, what I mean by that is, oh, I still don't like, I want to be sure that I'm sitting in the middle of everything. Okay, uh, No More Genies is when we unfortunately have preached and taught in so many places a genie concept of God. And what people have now is they have a genie concept of God. They think God is just a genie where you can say the magic word or where you can rub the magic lamp, where you can do so many things and that somehow is going to uh, make God do what you want him to do, like he's some kind of genie, okay? He's not a genie, okay? And genie concept is far-reaching, it's far-reaching. It's, it's much more deep than people think it is. And so I've been doing a series uh, called No More Genies. And so this is the fifth message. Now, you know, I, I had some Internet troubles over the summer. And so just got those worked out. But this is indeed the, the fifth, uh, fifth teaching in the No More Genies series. Okay? So... If you want to look up the other ones, if you want to catch up on the other teachings on No More Genies, because the first one is where I go through the intro and I explain it all in detail because I just gave you a brief run through. You can look up hashtag PDT, hashtag NMG for No More Genies, and then all of those videos will come up. Okay? Best place to find them is on my Facebook Live page, but if you just look up the hashtags, then you'll find them. Okay? Because they're also on my YouTube channel. All right, so let's get started tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you thanking you for your wonderful grace, thanking you for your mercy, thanking you for your wisdom, thanking you for your kindness, thanking you for your teaching, thanking you for your training, thanking you for fullness of joy in our hearts and our souls. So much joy, oh God, we don't know what to do. But, but we erupt with praise, oh God, uh, to give you the praise that's due your name out of grateful hearts, oh God. And, and we just thank you, oh God. There's so much going on in the world. Just every day, every hour, every second, every moment of life is a gift from you. And we ask you to forgive us, oh God, for taking that for granted. But I just want to thank you and I just want to praise you. So I want to thank you for an opportunity here tonight to release your word to the body of Christ. Because your kingdom is eternal. And before, or when it's all said and done, only your kingdom is going to stand. So thank you for this opportunity to tap into the eternal word of God. So speak through me, oh God. Breathe through my mouth. Not my will, but thine be done. So that you might be glorified, that the saints might be edified, and that the devil might be terrified. And we thank you for it, and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So tonight we're jumping into No More Genies, uh, again, uh, episode, chapter, lesson number five. So, now I want you to get my quick time going here. Test one, two. I want you to remember my tagline. My tagline is, God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to his servants, the prophets. Okay, one more time. God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to his servants, the prophets. Okay? So please like and share if you come on, if you're watching me live, but even if you're not, if you're watching this after... Uh, I finish. Please like and share these videos because that's what helps me get this word out to as many members of the body as can receive it. Okay, if you want to support me, uh, you can uh, give some money at my PayPal link, paypal.me, uh, my Prophet David Taylor link. That's in my Periscope profile and it's on every video I put on Facebook Live and it's also under the YouTube videos. And then also you can support me by going through Amazon Smile. Amazon Smile is where when you shop on Amazon, they donate a portion to the charity of your choice, and you can choose Prophet David Taylor NFP. Okay? My music is coming. I'm going to start featuring my music on the channel. I know I've been saying that all year, but it is coming. Okay? It's just a lot for me to try to get together, but it is coming. And we're going to get that back up on iTunes. You can support me that way. All right? And the way to find me is always to look up hashtag PDT. That's the fastest way to find me online. 
and you can find all of my prophetic teachings, okay? Because I've got a Facebook Live, I've got a Periscope, I've got a YouTube channel, I've got a SoundCloud, I've got a lot of stuff. That's the fastest way to find me. So my regular times are Sunday afternoon, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. That's my weekly broadcast. And then this time, uh, Thursday night, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time for about an hour where I do the No More Genies teaching specifically. That's what this is now, okay? All right, so let's dive right in. Tonight's topic is, what if I'm angry with God? What if I'm angry with God? And this will probably probably be part one because it's a lot I have to deal with tonight and we're probably going to run out of time. So I'm probably going to have to do a part two to give you the answers on how to work through. But tonight we're going to deal with part one of, what if I'm angry with God? Okay? And that's why you need to go back and watch my entire series about having a genie concept of God because all of that is rooted in God not meeting your expectations, <laughs> about God not being who you think he should be, about God not acting the way you think he should act, okay? But tonight I'm going to examine some very specific reasons as to why we get mad with God, okay? And all of those reasons are rooted in genie concept, because you think God has to be who you want him to be, and you think that God has to do what you want him to do. And you think that God has to act the way you want him to act. That is genie concept. He's not a genie. Okay? You don't say a magic word and you don't rub a magic lamp and then God just do what you say. He's not a genie. It doesn't work that way. Okay? I follow him. I serve him. We serve him. We bow down before him. He don't bow down before us. Okay? We do what he says. He don't do what we say. We follow him. He doesn't follow us. Okay? So you need to watch all of them so you can get the fullness of that. All right. So what if I'm angry with God? <clears throat> I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you, <clears throat> if you are angry with God tonight, I'm going to show you why. Okay? And so we're going to look at a lot of different scriptures. A lot of different scriptures. Okay? So let's look at our first scripture so I can show you the first points. Our first scripture is going to come out of Revelation, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the last book in the entire Bible. It's the last book of the New Testament, but it's the last book of the entire Bible, the book of Revelation. So you can't really miss it. It's the last book. Book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11. This is Jesus Christ speaking from heaven, showing Apostle John. The man that wrote the book of Revelation is Apostle John. He's the same disciple of Jesus, the disciple of John. He laid his hand on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He also wrote the Revelation. That's all the same guy. Okay? So Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. I'm reading out of King James. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. One more time. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Good God Almighty. Okay? So, what is that verse teaching us? Now, let me tell you something. This scripture that I just read, Revelation 4.11, that is the choke point for all of humanity. That's really the choke point for all of creation. You are either going to get past this scripture or you're not. This scripture determines everything that happens in your life. You know why? Because this scripture just told you two things, and this is why you're mad at God. The first thing this scripture told you is that he is God and you are not. It says, for thou hast created all things. For thou, or for you. He's talking about God. He's saying, for God has created all things. That means that you did not create all things. Okay? So, the well, number one reason you're mad at God is because he is God and you aren't, okay? You think that, that you set all this up. That's why God had to take Job on a nature walk at the end of the book of Job, because God had to show Job that God was the one that set all this up. He is God and you are not. And you are mad right now because you think that everything centers around you. But it says, for thou hast created all things. 
Okay, just stop and think a minute. Creation predates you. Do you know why we know that for a fact that creation predates you? We know that because you came out of your mother. That means your father and your mother got together and made you. That means that there was some stuff already here and some stuff already in motion before you came out. That doesn't tell you anything. That doesn't tell you that life didn't start when you started. And one more time, life didn't start when you started. Okay? So that's why you mad at God, because you think that all this got set in motion the day you came out your mother's womb, that somehow life revolves around you. But the Bible says very clearly in Revelation 4.11, For thou, God, God has created all things. So all this is the work of his hand, not your hand. He is God and you aren't. Okay? Life doesn't start when you start it. Life predates you. That means there's a whole bunch of stuff in motion for you showed up. He is God and you are not. That's why you're mad at him. You're talking to him as if you were God. As if all this came into being when you did. As if all this centers around you, but it doesn't. Okay? So that's principle number one. He is God and you are not. But let's read the last part of that. It says, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Oh, what did John just say? John said, For thou hast created all things, he is God, we are not. And for thy pleasure... You know what that means? That means that things work the way God wants them to work. For thy pleasure, they are and were created. He said they are and were created. That means that anything God has already created and anything that God is creating now or any kind of operation God has going on is for his pleasure that those things exist. So everything in creation is principle number two. Everything in creation works the way God wants it to work, not the way you want it to work. Oh, I said a mouthful of air. Now, when I start doing some teaching on marriage, I'm going to use that same scripture. Um, but that's one of the, the most practical real life examples I could ever give you of why people are mad at God. Because you think a bunch of stuff that you didn't create is supposed to work the way you want it to work. You didn't invent Men, you didn't invent women. Men don't have to work the way you think we should work. You didn't invent human sexuality. You didn't invent procreation. You didn't invent children. You didn't invent marriage. You didn't invent money. You didn't invent food. None of that is your invention. Okay? The Bible says, for his pleasure, they are and were created. These things exist because God wanted them to, and they're for his pleasure, and they work the way the Lord wants them to work. They don't work the way you think they should work. Okay? So as I said again, that's the choke point for all of humanity. 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 That is the choke point for all of humanity. All of creation. You are either going to get past that or you not. Everything in creation, the same God that made the butterfly, made the bullfrog. Do you know that God has a death squad? Death. D-E-A-T-H, death, right. I, I didn't stutter, you heard me right. God has a death squad. What is God's death squad? <clears throat> Mice, rats, lice, maggots, crows, ravens, vultures. They all feed on carrion. Did you know that? They all feed on corpses. They all feed on waste, excrement, cadavers, dead bodies. They're the death squad. They eat dead things. Did you know that? And did you know that Mr. Vulture doesn't get to raise his beak to the maker and say, why don't you make me the eagle? God made the eagle. God made the vulture. The eagles do what eagles do. Vultures do what vultures do. And vultures are part of God's death squad. They eat dead things. Mice, rats, lice, maggots, flies, crows, ravens, vultures. They eat dead things. Vultures are never going to be on a presidential seal. Vultures are never going to be on money, on the dollar bill. Eagles are. Vultures are not. 
Vultures don't get to raise their beak to God and say, why'd you make me like this? They got to do what they were created to do. Are you starting to see it? Okay, so it works the way God wants it to work, not the way you want it to work. And again, I'll use marriage as a reference. That's why people have such a hard time with marriage. People always talk about how hard marriage is, and there are a lot of reasons for that. And again, when I do some teaching on that, I'm going to go into that. But one of the foundational reasons that marriage is so hard is because you're convinced that marriage is supposed to work the way you think it should work. And it doesn't. Marriage does not work the way you think it should work. It works the way God designed it to work. But most people are going to spend their lives just trying to have their way. Okay? But the Bible says, again, he is God and you are not. And for his pleasure, all things are and were created. So everything in creation works the way God wants it to work, not the way you want it to work. So those are the first two reasons why you are mad at God. You're mad at God because you think all this sin is around you. Wrong. And you are mad at God because you think all this is supposed to work the way you want it to work. Wrong. Okay. So that's why you're mad at God. Principles one and two. Let's move on to the next. We're going to read Exodus 15, 3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now, I want to read that for you in a couple other translations. So let me find that. In the New Living Translation, it says, The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Okay? English Standard Version. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Okay? Contemporary English Version. The Lord is his name, and he is a warrior. Holman Christian Standard Bible, the Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. So reading it in all those translations, I think the message is pretty, pretty clear. The Bible says that the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Yahweh is his name. That's Exodus 15, 3. Let's look at Psalm 144, verse 1. Psalm chapter 144, verse 1. That says, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. One more time. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. What does that mean? Okay. It, it means exactly what it says, that God is our strength, but he teaches these right here. He teaches my hands to war. And he teaches my fingers how to fight. So, uh, we went over the first two reasons. Here's the third reason you're mad at God. If you're angry at God, here's the third reason why. Third reason why is because you didn't expect to have to fight. Somewhere along the way, we got this idea in our heads. And when I say me, I mean humanity. I mean people. We got this idea in our heads that the Garden of Eden or life on earth or whatever, whatever your worldview, that it was supposed to be this idyllic kind of thing. Now, I wasn't there in the Garden of Eden. I don't know what it looked like. All I know is what the scripture says. But the scripture says that we are made in his image after his likeness. That's the first thing God spoke over us humans. He said let us make man after our image, after our, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Okay? That's, the, that's the, the genesis, the origin of us as humans. That's the first thing God said about us. So right here, the Bible says that the Lord himself is a man of war, that the Lord is a warrior, and blessed be the Lord my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Okay? Number three reason you are mad at God is because you didn't expect to have to fight. You thought you were going to be able to go through life and not have any fights and not have any battles. And that's not in the Bible. That's why I preach and teach so hard against genie concept. Because I declare unto you, I've heard people say over and over and over and over and over again that God made the world wrong or God should have made the world differently or this ain't supposed to be like this or blah, 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 blah. Well, you're mad at God because you didn't think you was going to have to fight. But the Bible never says that. The, the Bible says the opposite, that the Lord is a man of war, that the Lord is a warrior. So what that means is that if I'm made in his image, that means I'm a warrior too. And, and if he's my strength, he teaches me to war. 
He teaches my fingers to fight. That means I'm going to have to fight. That's why a whole lot of people are mad at God. Because whatever it is that you're dealing with, whether you're dealing with finances or whether you're dealing with marriage or relationships or your career or your health or whatever it is that you're dealing with, you didn't expect to have to fight. That's why you're mad at God. And a whole lot of people get to that point and they get stuck. I mean, they get stuck for years. I mean, they get stuck for decades. Because they ran up against something and they thought that thing was just going to lay down like a magic carpet. They thought that thing was going to be like, a, like a, a, a yellow brick road or a magic bridge. They thought when you saw that obstacle, they was going to say, oh, hey, it's David. <laughs> Let me get out the way. And it was just going to do that. And no, 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 no. You had to take out your sword and your shield. You had to armor up. You had to fight. And a whole lot of people didn't expect that to happen. A whole lot of Christians. And I'm sad to say that sometimes when we first come into the kingdom, see, when you're born in the natural out of your mother's womb, you're just a baby. You're an infant and you're nothing but vulnerable. You need to be taken care of. You need to be fed, clothed. You need to be cleaned up because you can't do anything for yourself. Well, I stopped by to tell you that when you first get saved, that's the exact same experience you have in the spirit. You're just a baby in the spirit. You're new to the kingdom of God. You're just a babe in Christ. And it's just like being born in the natural, except you're a baby in the spirit. So that means you need to be fed, clothed, cleaned up, and somebody needs to take care of you and show you what you do because you're still new to the kingdom of God. Okay? And so when we first get saved, what happens is we get a lot of messages that give us the wrong idea. Oh, Lord. And sometimes when we first get saved, people are so busy rejoicing over us being saved and they want us to come to church and they, they want us to do a whole bunch of stuff that's many times related to church work until sometimes they don't tell us the whole truth. Sometimes they don't give us the right impression of what's really going on. And I stopped by to tell you, you going to have to fight. In this life, you going to have to fight. Now, the good news is, is that through Christ, we can win. Okay? If we learn how to be obedient to the voice of Christ, if we learn how to surrender our lives, and you hear me say it all the time, not just accept Jesus as Savior, but accept him as Lord. We learn how to do what the Lord says do, when the Lord says do it, the way the Lord says do it. When you get into obedience with the Lord like that, then you can win your fights. But what we thought, and sometimes what we were taught, is that God was going to take away the fight. no. No, that's wrong. You're going to have to fight. And I know some of y'all, some of y'all thought God was going to take away the fight. I know you thought because you were taught that, unfortunately, when you first became a Christian. Somebody said something to you like, hey, Victoria, God bless you. God bless you, too. Somebody said something to you like, come to Jesus and everything's going to be all right. So you got the idea. That's why I preach and teach so hard against genie concept. You got the idea that this relationship with Jesus was going to be magic. And now that you were a Christian, the Lord was just going to wave his mighty hand and take away all of your conflict. That ain't nowhere in the Bible. You find me that promise. You find me that promise anywhere where God says that when you get born again, when you get saved, He's going to wave his mighty hand and take away all of your conflict. That's right, Victoria. It's hard truth. That's right. That's not in the scripture. You're going to have to fight. Okay? And so the number three reason that you are mad at God is because you did not expect to have to fight. And so let me do this. On behalf of any preacher, any member of the clergy, any pastor, any, any priest, any prophet, any apostle, any evangelist, that gave you the wrong impression when you first came into the kingdom, I'm sorry. I want to apologize to you on their behalf. I'm sorry that someone gave you the idea that being a Christian meant that God was going to wipe away all of your conflict. That is not the truth. You going to have to fight. Okay? So, so next time, like I said, I knew I wouldn't be able to get to everything this time. Next time, I'm going to show you how to work through this anger. But tonight, this message is just helping you identify the anger. Okay, so number one, number one reason you're mad at God is because he is God and you're not. Number two, creation works the way he wants it to work, not the way you want it to work. Number three, 
you mad at God because you didn't expect to have to fight. Okay, so let's move on to the next. Okay, the next we're going to look at a bunch of different scriptures. The next point, we're going to start with 1 Peter 4 and 12. Now, 1 Peter, this man Peter, was the famous apostle Peter, the one that walked with Jesus, that was one of the 12 disciples, the one that denied Jesus, that began to curse and swear, and then the rooster crowed, and the one that ended up, when he died, he got crucified upside down, and he preached on the day of Pentecost, and, and uh, 3,000 souls got saved, and the one where if you walk in the shadow, you get healed. That's all the same man, okay? That's Apostle Simon, surnamed Peter, okay? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Oh, let me read that again. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Okay? What did Peter just tell you? Peter just told you that not only are you going to go through a trial, but you're going to go through a fiery trial. It's not going to just be a trial. It's going to be a trial by fire. And then Peter said, don't think that that's strange. In other words, what Peter is telling us is that that's supposed to happen when you're a Christian. Let me read it again. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. So Apostle Peter, the one that walked and talked with Jesus, looked Jesus right in the face. He put his hands on Jesus. He walked and talked with Jesus the Christ. Apostle Peter said that you're not just going to go through a trial. You're going to go through trials of fire. And that's supposed to happen. It's not a strange thing. Now, I have been through a literal trial by fire. What do I mean by that? I mean, I was in a house fire. I'm a fire survivor. Okay, me and my son, you've heard me tell the story many times. My son woke up, knocked on my door. I didn't hear what he said. <coughs> I walked outside, didn't have no clothes on. I opened my door and there was flames 13 feet high all around my apartment. The walls were on fire. The bathroom was on fire. The kitchen was on fire. The front door was on fire. The ceiling was collapsing. I'm a literal fire. I've been through literal fire. Okay? I'm not making that up. I've been through literal fire. But the Bible says we're also going to go through a fiery trial. And Peter said, it's not strange. It's going to happen because it's a part of our faith walk. It's the thing that proves our faith because our faith cannot be proven in good times. It don't take no faith to believe God in good times. It's when the going gets rough, do you believe God then? Okay, I'm going to give you some examples in the scripture. We're going to look at Job. Now, Job is in the Old Testament. If you're not familiar with the story of Job, uh, you really read, really need to read it because it's a very intense story, okay? We're going to look at Job chapter 1. And we're going to start at verse 13. Now, the first 12 verses are about Satan accusing Job in front of the throne of God. We're going to start at verse 13. And there was a day when his, Job's, sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job, who said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them, and took them away. Yea, they have slain thy servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, That's three so far. The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell you. While he was yet speaking, here comes servant number four. There came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drink, drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell you. Good grief. Now, when you read the first 12 verses, I don't read the first 12 verses. The first 12 verses are the devil 
accusing Job before God's throne. God is in heaven bragging about, about Job because Job uh, serves God with fear and Job has high moral and ethical integrity. But the devil says, yeah, of course Job serves you because you protect everything he's got. But I bet you if you let me at him, I bet you I'll make him curse you to your face. And then the devil came after Job. But what did the devil do? First thing the devil did was he took away Job's oxes and he took away Job's donkeys. The Sabaeans, so those are some uh, other people that weren't part of Job's people, fell upon Job's livestock and took them away and killed all the shepherds that were taking care of them. Okay? Then the next thing that happened was he said the fire of God, but it wasn't the fire of God, it was the devil came from heaven and burned up the sheep and the shepherds and consumed them. So that means that all of Job's sheep and all of the, the people that took care of Job's sheep caught fire and they burned up, they died. And then the next thing was, he said, the Chaldeans, that's a whole other group of people, a group of foreigners, came and they took away Job's camels and carried them away. So they stole all his camels and they killed all the people that would take care of the camels. And only one person escaped to come tell Job. And then uh, the last thing that got hit were Job's kids. And he says that his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And then a tornado came. A great wind came. It says from the wilderness. That means it came out of nowhere. And smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. That means that the devil hit the four corners of the house that they were drinking wine in and knocked the walls down and caused them walls to cave in and kill all of Job's children at once. He lost all 10 of his children at one time. Look at what happened to Job. Uh, camels gone, uh, donkeys, mules gone, servants killed with the sword. Fire falls, burns up the sheep, burns up the servants. Chaldeans come, steals the camels again, more camels being taken away. Um, uh, excuse me, the first one were oxen, so his oxen and his donkeys were gone, then the camels were taken away uh, by the Chaldeans, killed all the, the camel attenders, the shepherds took care of the camels, and then there was some type of tornado, and it struck the house that all of Job's kids were in and killed all the children at one time. And all that came from the devil. So what's my point? My point is what I told you in 1 Peter 4 and 12. Peter said, it's not just going to be a trial. It's going to be a fiery trial. Look what happened to Job. God was in heaven bragging on Job. You need to read the first uh, 12 verses. I didn't have time to go through them all now. But God was in heaven bragging on Job because Job's integrity and his ethics were so strong that they had reached up to heaven and God was in heaven bragging on him. That didn't stop the devil from accusing Job that didn't stop the devil from, amen, Sister Victoria, that didn't stop the devil from coming after Job. And uh, so the fourth principle, the reason that you are mad at God tonight is because you didn't expect Satan to hit you so hard. But God tells us in the word, that's why you hear me say all the time, you need to read the Bible for yourself. You are not supposed to have your relationship with God through someone else. Other people there are there to help you. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, deacons, bishops, elders are there to help you in your relationship with God, not substitute for your relationship with God. You need to read the Bible for yourself. I can't stress that enough. If you don't ever listen to anything else I say, listen to that. You need to read the scriptures for yourself because the Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. That, and I just read to you what happened to Job, a man with so much integrity and so, such moral fiber and such strong business ethics. It says later on in the book of Job, Job says, I don't cheat on my wife. I don't cheat my workers out of their money. I don't cheat on my taxes. Job said, I'm not a cheater. On any level, he had strong morals and strong ethics, and that did not stop the devil from coming after him. Just because you got strong morals and just because you got strong ethics is not going to stop the devil from accusing you before the throne of God 
is not going to stop the devil from coming after you. And 1 Peter 4.12 says us, it's not just going to be a trial. It's going to be a fiery trial. Okay? And so the reason you mad at God tonight, if you mad at God tonight, I gave you the first three. But the fourth reason you mad at God is because you didn't expect the devil to hit you so hard. But he will. The Bible says he will because we're going to be tried by fire. And again, why are we tried by fire? We get tried by fire because your faith cannot be proven in good times. It doesn't take any faith to believe God in good times. Okay? Your faith is proven when you are tried by fire. Do you believe God then? Do you believe God? You see, because I've been there. I, uh, I've been there where it looked like everything just falling apart. I've been there where it looked like everything just stopped up. Everything just burned up. Where it looked like every good thing you had, somebody just come in and take it away. I have been there. Okay? So that's what I mean when I tell you. We all going to go through that. It doesn't say fiery trial if you're a prophet. If you're a pastor. That's another. Okay, see, that's another wrong impression that you got. So let me apologize again. If you got the impression by your religious background that only spiritual or religious leaders go through fiery trials, that's not the truth. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the fiery trial is going to try you. So if you are a believer and follower of Christ, that fiery trial is coming. Okay? I'm sorry they didn't tell you that when you first got saved. I'm sorry they didn't tell you that when you joined the church. Because many times when you join the church, they want you to come in and do some church work and get busy and don't be a bench woman, don't be a pew rider and blah, blah, all that different kind of stuff. But they forgot to tell you that the fiery trial is coming. But the Bible tells you it's coming. That's why you got to read the scripture for yourself. And sometimes, right, sunshines and rainbows, right. That's what we get sold many times with our religious backgrounds. And that's why sometimes when it hit, it hit so hard, you are shocked. God already told you you're going to be tried by fire. But sometimes we get mad at God in the midst of that because we didn't expect it. We didn't expect the devil to hit us so hard. Devil coming after you hard. Devil coming after your kids. Devil coming after your, your oxen, your donkeys, your camels. That means your livestock, your investments, your career. Uh, in the second chapter of Job, there's a verse where it says the devil struck Job with boils. And if you've ever seen a boil... Boils are not zits and blackheads. Blackheads and pimples are little. Boils are big like my nose. Like, so you, I want you to imagine something big like my nose, like this all over you. That's what the devil did to Job. And that was all up and down his body. So the first wave, the devil hit his money, his investments, his livestock, and killed his children and killed all his servants. Some of his servants got impaled by the sword. Some of his servants burned up with fire. The second wave of attack, the devil hit Job's body. And, hit a, and I told you, boil is big like this. They're not pimples. They're big like this. Look, I mean, if you look it up online, it's really nasty. So I would just warn you that if you actually Google a boil, it's going to gross you out if you see it. But boils are big, like my nose. They're not like pimples or blackheads. So if you want to see what a boil looks like, then, then Google it. Hey, Sister Sheila and Sister Erica, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Um, if you want to see what a boil looks like, go ahead on and Google it. But I just warn you. That is nasty, and they're big. Well, the devil came in Job chapter 2, and he put boils literally all over Job's body. Not just on his face. The Bible says from his head to his feet. So I want you to imagine waking up tomorrow, and you got big, ugly, gross all over you. You don't even look like yourself anymore. Okay? That's what happened to the man in the Bible that had so much moral fiber and integrity that God himself was boasting on him. That didn't stop the devil from accusing him. That didn't stop the devil from coming after him. It's not going to stop the devil from coming after you. So, uh, reason number four, if you're mad at God, the reason you're mad at God is because you didn't expect the devil to hit you so hard. But he will. He's coming. And you need to get ready. Okay? All right. Let's move on. Because I told you I have a lot to give you. So this is probably, again, going to be part one. Okay. Uh, let's read the next scriptures. 
well, Genesis chapter 3, Genesis' first book in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. You're very familiar with this, but I'm going to show you something maybe you haven't seen before. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, now let's jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, written by Apostle Paul, chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. Likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. That word incontinency, uh, that word that we see in English, actually means a lack of self-control. Okay? So what's my point in those two scriptures? I'm going to show you something maybe you haven't seen before. Okay, so point number one, why are you mad at God? You're mad at God because he's God and you're not. Point number two, you're mad at God because everything in creation works the way God designed it to work, not the way you think it should work. Point number three, you're mad at God because you didn't expect to have to fight. Point number four, you're mad at God because you did not expect Satan to hit you so hard. Here come point number five. Point number five, if you're angry at God tonight, the reason you're mad at God is because you didn't understand that Satan watches marriage. Good God Almighty, I know what I'm talking about, okay? You didn't understand the devil was in the Garden of Eden watching the first marriage. What did he do? He came to Eve and gave her some new information. That means he was there. The devil, Lucifer, had already fallen from heaven and jumped into the body of a snake. When did that happen? Don't know. The scripture doesn't really say. All we know is once God got through creating Adam and Eve and told them to have dominion to be fruitful and multiply and told them you can have all the fruit you want, but don't touch the fruit of the tree in the middle and have dominion over creeping things, follow the air, fish of the sea. And God set them off on their journey that right after that, the devil came to the woman in the body of the snake because Lucifer had already body jumped. He body jumped. Remember when Jesus cast all those demons out of the man that uh, we call legion, they said we are legion because we are many. Jesus cast them out and they said, let us go into the pigs. They body jumped because that's what demons do. They body jump. So the devil had already body jumped into the, the body of the snake and he was talking to Eve out the snake's mouth because he was watching their marriage. Okay? And then the Bible says, again, 1 Corinthians 7 uh, five, defraud you not one the other except to be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempts you not for your incontinency or lack of self-control. So in other words, if you're not taking care of your partner in marriage, if you are starving your spouse sexually or actually any other way, this, these verses are talking about sexually, but emotionally, financially, sexually, if you're starving your partner, I stopped by to tell you the devil's watching your marriage because the devil watched the first marriage. And if you're mad at God, it's because your marriage got hit. I guarantee you, you took your spouse for granted, thought you didn't have to take care of them, thought you didn't have to love them, thought you didn't have to say nice things. You just took them for granted and the devil hit your marriage because you didn't know the devil watching your marriage. The devil watched the first marriage and came up to the woman and contradicted the very word of God. I keep telling you, the devil don't care nothing about you and contradicted the very word of God and put that in Eve's head, okay? That doesn't tell you anything. The devil was watching the first marriage. He watching your marriage. And if you're mad at God tonight, it's because you didn't understand that Satan watching your marriage. That means he's just waiting. 
He's going to come in the body of something else. He's just waiting. See my hand moving like a snake? He's just waiting. He's just waiting. He's just waiting. He's just waiting. And then one day he's going to walk up to the husband and the wife and say, did God really say that? Did he really say that? What happens if you're vulnerable? What happens if y'all haven't had sex in months? Or in some cases, years? What happens if y'all ain't speaking? What happens if y'all have a list of things you haven't forgiven each other for? What happens if you're defrauding each other? You just refuse to make love to your partner. He's just waiting. Waiting for that day. He's just waiting. He's just watching. He's just waiting. Because he was already there in the Garden of Eden. Watching the first marriage. And if you're mad at God today, it's because you didn't understand. It's not God, because I just read the scripture. The scripture says that the husband has to render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise the wife unto the husband. That's a nice way of Paul saying you're supposed to make love to your spouse. You're not supposed to withhold sex. Sex is not a negotiated benefit in a marriage. It's a guaranteed benefit. When you take the ring and you take the last name and you take the vows, that means you owe the sex. And if you don't like that, the devil going to break up your marriage, which is exactly what you deserve. You've got the nerve to ask another human being for a covenant of monogamy, and then you refuse to take care of them. You say, I don't want you to go anywhere else but me, and then you starve them. The devil just laughing at you. He's laughing at you because he's just waiting because God told you, wife do benevolence, a wife also the husband. You know what do benevolence means? That means you owe your husband some sex. That means you owe your wife some sex. That's what comes along with the marriage. It's not negotiated. It's guaranteed. And if you don't do it, the Bible then goes on to say the wife has not power of her own body. That means when you got married, you surrendered rights to your body to your husband. And the husband has not power over, over his own body, but the wife. That means when you got married, you surrender rights to your body to your wife. So we don't have any business going over here and getting into adultery. Because we're supposed to be at home making love to our own husbands and our own wives. That's how the one that invented marriage, God, tells us how to be married. And then he says, if you defraud, in other words, you owe your spouse. Because defraud means we made a contract and now I'm not going to hold up my end of the deal. That's what it means to defraud. I promise you something because you stood up there at that church and you said, I do, I will, I take. I take, I will, I do. You said that. They went up there by themselves. You owe them that. And then it says, if you defraud them, I owe you, but I ain't going to give you what I owe. It says, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. So I don't have time to read the scripture in Leviticus, but there's only two times married couples aren't supposed to be having sex. One is when your wife's on her period. Leave your wife alone when she's on a period. Let her get through her cycle and clean herself up. Then y'all move forward. Number two is when you're fasting and praying. That's the only time you're not supposed to be having sex when you marry. You're not doing them no favor. That's what you owe. And the Bible says, but if you're defrauding, and it's not because she's on a period, that's in Leviticus, and because it's not you're fasting and praying, because you're fasting and praying, it says you're supposed to come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your lack of self-control. But notice what the scriptures say. He said, your lack of self-control. So in other words, if something else that you might want get in your face, you might have a self-control problem. Now you done jumped over into adultery. Now you got two problems. The first problem was that you weren't making love to your spouse like you're supposed to. Now you're having an affair. That's why we need to do what the Lord tells us to do. Marriage don't work the way we think it's supposed to work. It works the way God designed it to work. And God told you that if you get married, you owe your spouse some sex on the regular. And if you don't do that, the devil's watching you. He's just waiting. Okay? So if you're mad at God tonight about your marriage, it's because you didn't understand the devil was watching. Because he watched the first marriage. Okay? So let's move on because I want to make sure I get in all these reasons tonight. Okay. Ooh, Lord, this is a long one. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next point. Uh, I think I'll just give you the scriptures and you can read them. Uh, but I do want you to read them. Well, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and read them. because Okay. Revelation 12, 1 through 6. Uh, Revelation, again, last book in the Bible. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. 
She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Okay, that's all signs and symbols for how Satan deceived a third of the angels and turned them into demons and got them, seduced them into following him. Okay? Then it says, The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. Okay, that's Revelation 12, 1 through 4. Verse 5, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. That means that was Mary and Jesus. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Okay? Exodus 1, verses 15 through 22. And the king of Egypt, that's Pharaoh, spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the, other, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then, sh then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing, and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively, and are delivered, ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Now, there's also a uh, verse, Matthew 2.16. When Herod, this is when Jesus was a little boy. When Herod saw that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was filled with rage. Sending orders, he put to death all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, according to the time he had learned from the Magi. Uh, now, we have named that the slaughter of the innocents, if you ever heard that phrase. So, <clears throat> what's my point? Revelation 12, 1 through 6, the devil was standing before a pregnant Mary to give birth to Jesus. Exodus 1, 15 through 22, Pharaoh said, kill all the male children. And that's why Moses' mama put him uh, in the ark on the river to save his life. Matthew 2, 16, Herod, when Jesus was born, killed all the male children age of two years and under. What's my point? My point is Satan doesn't care about pregnant women, mothers, or newborn infants. The reason you are mad at God is because you thought there was some special protection because you're a woman, because you're pregnant, or for babies. That's not in the Bible. I know. I know your brain just exploded. That whole thing that we say, women and children first, came out of uh, the Romantic period. It came out of some, some stories. It came out of some books and some lore. It's actually not biblical, which is another reason why I'm sorry that it's so ingrained in America. When I say our, I mean American culture. Because there is no women and children first. That's not, ain't nowhere in the Bible. There's no spe special protection for you if you're female, if you're pregnant, or if you're a baby. And I just read you three scriptures where the devil came, the devil came after Jesus' mama. And the devil was standing right before Mary to try to kill Jesus. That's what Herod was doing by killing all the boys under two years old, two years old and under. Herod was trying to get to Jesus. That's the devil. Remember I told you, the devil has something else's face on. That's the devil working through Herod, trying to kill the Lord so he couldn't even grow up. And then in uh, Pharaoh, he said, when the, when the uh, Hebrew women are given birth, he said, when the baby came out, if it's a boy, kill it. So what's my point? My point is the devil don't, they don't care about you if you're a pregnant woman, if you're a mom, or if, if you're a baby. He'll kill you just the same. And then what the devil does, he walks up to you and says, if God is so good, why he let that happen? Oh. Haven't you heard people say that? How many people have you heard say, if God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? That's the devil. <laughs> it's right there in the scripture. That's why you have to read the scripture for yourself. That's why you hear me say that all the time. The devil don't care nothing about you if you're a woman. The devil don't care nothing about you if you're pregnant. The devil don't care nothing about you, nothing about infants. The devil will eat you alive. 
The devil will run babies through with swords. The devil will gobble infants up. The devil will persecute, persecute you and try to destroy you as a pregnant woman, as a woman carrying a child. The devil don't care nothing about. Ain't no special protection for women, pregnant women, or babies. That's not in the Bible. If you know the story of Christ when he was a little boy, actually, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph had to get up and run to Egypt to escape the, the wrath of Herod. That's Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. They had to pull up. They had to break camp. Why? Because all them little boys died. Satan working through Herod trying to get to Jesus. Do you understand? I know your brain just exploded. I know you have probably not, never heard that your whole life. That's why I do this teaching about no more genies. You've got to get out of the genie concept where there's some type of magic shield over you because you're a woman. No, there's not. There's some type of magic shield over you because you're pregnant. No, no, no. Or that ain't going to happen to my baby. Lord have mercy. What about all those little boys that died when the devil through Herod was trying to kill little boy Jesus? What about all those women uh, whose sons were murdered when Pharaoh was trying to get rid of Moses? Because whenever a chosen, chosen child of God is born into the world, whenever a deliverer is born, the devil recognizes that anointing. Because remember, the devil has known God longer than we have. So when God drops the apostolic and the prophetic, the deliverance, the leadership anointing into uh, a pregnant woman's belly in the baby, the devil sees that and the devil's coming after that mama. And the devil's coming after that child. Because the devil, if the devil can't kill you in the womb, he's going to try to kill you when you're little so you never grow up, so you never change the world. Because Moses changed the world. Jesus Christ obviously changed the world. But the devil tried to kill them both as infants and killed a whole lot of other people trying to get to them. Oh. And if you're mad at God, it's because you thought there was some kind of special protection. No, there's not. Now, now, Prophet Taylor, are you saying that, that this is going to happen inevitably? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you're going to have to pray and ask God to protect you. Okay? Uh, let me tell the same thing to someone today. Right. You're going to have to pray and ask God because you might have to flee. If Jesus, Lord have mercy, if Jesus had to flee, if Jesus has a little boy, the angel spoke to Joseph, Mary, and little boy Jesus, two-year-old Jesus, and said, get up out of here. You might have to flee. You might have to move, change your city. You might have to move out of your apartment. There's a whole lot of things. And, and that's why sometimes even the saints die because you weren't listening to God. I just gave this example on Sunday during my broadcast. I'll give it again here. Let's say the, the Lord knows that the devil's going to try to have you cause you to have a car accident on Thursday. The devil's going to have somebody out there on the highway drunk driving. They're going to jump the meridian and come at you at 90 miles an hour. So on Wednesday, you hear the Holy Ghost say, don't take that way to work tomorrow. Now right there, if you hear the voice of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost done told you, don't go that way to work tomorrow, if you disobey, you're taking your life in your hands because the devil has a bullet out there, a drunk driver out there with your name on it. You have to obey God to avoid Satan. Jesus himself had to up and flee to avoid Satan. That don't tell you nothing? Because the devil don't care nothing about you if you're a woman, if you're pregnant, or about your child. So my son can tell you, my kids can tell you, that, that when you leave my house, you don't leave my house without prayer. You don't walk back out through that door without me praying for you. Okay? Because I understand this principle. You've got to saturate your kids with prayer. You've got to stay before God. God, please lead me. Please guide me. Because there's the devil out here that don't care nothing about my child. Don't care nothing about babies. Don't care nothing about you being pregnant. He'll take you out. That's why. So, and then he'll have the nerve to walk up to you and say, if God is so good, why he let this happen? That's not God. That's the devil. He don't care nothing about you. So reason number, I believe that's principle number five. That's why you mad at God because you thought that ain't supposed to happen to me. Jesus the Christ had to flee for his life as a two-year-old boy. That don't tell you nothing? Okay, so let's move on. And then, okay, and then I'm going to recap. Right, we're at the last one. Okay, here's the last one. Galatians 6, 7 through 10. You're very familiar with this? Is there such a thing as guaranteed protection by God if we pray? Yes, there is, because 
In Psalms it says he gives his, his angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways. They bear us up in our hands lest we dash our foot against a stone. But just like Jesus said in the wilderness, we must be in obedience to God. You can't just live any kind of way you want to and then claim God's protection. That's what a lot of people end up doing. A lot of people don't understand that they're not in the will of God. And that's how come, that's how come the devil caught them. And then here's this other thing. I'm about to read this, this last thing. But yes, God does promise us protection. He promise us, promises us angelic protection. The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him and delivers them. But notice the promise. The angels don't camp around about you lest you fear God. And if you fear God, you're going to be doing what the Lord says do. Then you get delivered. That's why I preach so hard against genie concept. Because for too long, people have taught these Bible verses like they're automatic. And then when something tragic happens, we don't know what to do. Sometimes we got caught out there in disobedience. Sometimes the Lord told you, don't stay in that city. And you disobeyed, and then something happened in that city, and you got caught. Okay? What's the example of that in the Bible? Lot and his family. God uh, sent the angels to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. He woke Lot up and said, you and your family get out of here. We can't destroy the city until you leave, but don't look back. Okay? Uh, I don't know. Now, that's a good question. I don't know. You have to examine each situation individually. So no, I can't extrapolate and say that every time a child of God dies, it was disobedience because there's no way for me to know that. Every time something happened, it doesn't necessarily mean someone was in disobedience. You don't know what was going on in their life. There's a scripture where Jesus says that there's a tower, the Tower of Siloam, that fell on some people and they died. And Jesus Christ said, don't think that the people that died in the Tower of Siloam were worse sinners just because they died tragically. So in other words, whenever there's some type of tragedy or death or something like that, you have to go to God individually on a case-by-case -case basis and ask the Lord what was going on in this situation. And the Lord may not give you any answers because, you know, God is not obligated to give us answers. But no, you can't extrapolate and say, amen. You can't extrapolate and say, this was this and because you don't know that. I'm saying that you need to understand that the devil is out there and he doesn't care anything about you and you don't have automatic, automagic special protection just because you're a woman or you're pregnant or because you're a baby. You have to ask God on the scene and say, Lord, where do I go? Lord, how do I avoid the devil? Lord, which way do I take to work? Lord, where should I live? You got to be in the will of God. You got to be obedient. You see what I mean? So I know it's a complex subject, and I know that we really seek for answers. That's why I have to explain it some more, because there's a lot more to it than what I, I can't, you know, I can't make all the words come out my mouth at the same time. It's a very complex subject. But no, when someone dies tragically, don't assume anything. If you want to know, go before the Lord and ask the Lord what was going on in this situation. Because remember, there was that man that was born blind, and they went to the Lord and they said, who sinned that this man was born blind? And the Lord said, nobody sinned. Neither this man nor his parents. It just happened. Some stuff just happens. So that's what I mean when I say, don't, you know, don't try to look at situations in life and interpret them. This means this and that means that. Every situation is individual. But the point I'm making here with the point about the devil is that the devil's out there and he, and he doesn't give you any special, I mean, there's no special exceptions. And that's why so many people have not learned Amen, thank you. That's why so many people, that's why I cover my kids in prayer every day. Because remember, I tell you all the time, there's nothing that I tell you about that I myself am not doing. I pray for my children every day. And I mean every day. I mean every day God gives me breath. I'm before his throne praying for my kids because I understand his principle. I cannot possibly be with them all the time. And even if I was, I can't protect them from everything that's out there. But the Lord can. But I've got to ask. I've got to claim his word. And I have to be obedient as their father. Because King David's disobedience got some of his kids killed. King Saul's disobedience got some of his kids killed. Did you know that? Do you see what I mean? We have to obey God. <laughs> These promises are not magic. You can't just do whatever you want to do and then spread a little scripture on it and think God just going to wave his hand and everything going to be all right. That's what we've been taught by bad religious teaching. 
You got to obey God. You got to believe God. That's all. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay? The promises are for those that are willing and obedient. Okay? So let me make this last point. Galatians 6, 7 through 10, a very familiar passage of Scripture. Galatians 6, 7 through 10, do not be, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart, or if we faint not. Uh, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to, especially to those who are the household of faith. So the last principle I'm going to give you tonight about why you're mad at God is because it's possible that you sowed corruption but you didn't expect to reap it. Let me read it again. Verse 8, Galatians chapter 6, verse 8, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So let me give you a practical example so you know what that looks like. Don't nobody start smoking at 40. <laughs> if you are 40 years old or older, you didn't start smoking when you was 40. You started smoking when you were young, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. Why did you start smoking? You started smoking because you thought it was cool. You started smoking because your friends were doing it. And you started smoking because you wanted to be rebellious against your parents. Okay, that's when you was 12. If you live to see 40, you are going to be so sorry you ever knew what cigarettes were. By the time you get through, when you look back at all the money you spent on cigarettes over the course of your life, when you look back at what it's done to your teeth, and when you look back at all the possible cancers, that cigarettes can affect your body with uh, tongue cancer, throat cancer, lip cancer, uh, all the possible cancers that come from decades worth of smoking. You're going to be sorry. You, and, and it's all in your clothes. You know, when you smoke, it's just all in your clothes. Because you can tell a smoker because they smell like smoke. You can't get away from that smell if you smoke. And so you're going to be sorry that you ever knew what cigarettes were. But there's some corruption that has grown in your body because you sold to the flesh. Sometimes we get mad at God, and that's the last principle I'm going to give you tonight. Sometimes we get mad at God because we have sown corruption and we didn't expect to reap it. Oh, I know that one's rough. I know the other stuff I talked about was the devil, and I know we love to blame the devil, but there are some verses in the Bible here where it says, don't be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows. Now that's talking about us. That's talking about me. That's talking about you. It says, whatever a man sows, there's no Satan in those verses. Did you notice that? Did you notice that there's no, there's no devil in those verses? God is not mocked. Now, let me throw something in right here. The Bible says God is not mocked. But I want you to notice what the Bible does not say. The Bible does not say you should not mock God. If the Bible said God should not be mocked, that means it would be possible to mock God, but it's something that you shouldn't do. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God is not mocked. That means it's impossible to mock God. You literally can't do it. You can't mock God. You can't. So it goes on to say, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. You can't mock God. It's not possible to mock God. So it says, for he that sows his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. I gave you the example of cigarettes. Let me give you another example about relationships. It always turns back on you. That's right. Haven't you ever seen those people that got together with somebody by cheating, and then later on in that relationship, that same person that they took from somebody else by cheating, cheats on them, and then they get mad. <laughs> Haven't you ever seen that? So, so this person is married, or they in a relationship, and you decide you just have to have them. So now you're the other man or the other woman, and you're over here having a relationship with this man's wife or this woman's husband, and you're the other person. Then you take them from the marriage, and now y'all are married, and y'all are together, and now y'all are a couple. Later on on the game, you find out now that same person that cheated with you now has cheated on you, and you got the nerve to get mad. <laughs> Why are you mad? You were already with someone that proved that they would break their vows. Because they broke their vows to be with you on the side. So if you knock that other person out and you become the new husband, and you become the new wife, 
then later on, that same person going to cheat on you because you going to reap just exactly what you sow because you can't mock God. You step past marriage vows. Somebody said before God and take vows and you did everything you could to seduce that man or seduce that woman to get in bed with you. And now that you're the main person, somebody else is going to come along and do everything they can to seduce that person to get with them. Because you're going to reap just exactly what you sow. And then you're going to have the nerve to get mad. While some of them, that's right. That always happens. That never fails. You can't get together with people by cheating and think that relationship is going to be blessed. It's not going to be blessed. You can't take somebody, another woman's husband, and think God's going to bless that. You can't take another man's wife. I wish I could call King David to the stand. You can't take another man's wife and think God's going to bless that. He won't, okay? You going to reap just exactly what you sow. And if you take someone from someone that they married to, someone going to come along and take that person from you. Write it down. It's going to happen. It's not a question of if. It's a question of when. So that's why the Bible says not to be deceived. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself if you sow to the flesh. So the last reason I'm going to give you tonight about why you might be mad at God, you might be mad at God because you are mistaking what you're experiencing. What you're experiencing is a harvest. You sowed something. That's why you're getting that corruption. You did something. Now, that's not always the case, like, you know, in Daniel's case and like in Job's case and Joseph's case. But if you know good and well, you've been sowing to your flesh, you know good and well, you've been smoking for 20, 30 years. Then all of a sudden you've got spots on your lungs. How are you going to get mad at God? You sowed all that, that, that poison in your lungs. You know, you've been cheating on your wife for years. You've been cheating on your husband for years or you're single, but you specialize in getting with married people. When you get married, your spouse going to cheat on you. How you going to get mad? Because you're going to reap just exactly what you sow. And some people are mad at God because you don't like your harvest. Because you thought you weren't going to have to reap it. You're mistaken. Uh, let me give you another practical example. You can ignore your kids if you want to. Kids can't raise themselves. I wish I had a dollar. For every time some parent got mad at the child that they didn't invest in. Them hormones hit your kids same way they hit you, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. Well, when you first step into adolescence, those hormones, man, you're out of control. You don't, you don't know what to do all that. That's the first time you experienced all that. And everything is just different. Your body changes, your life changes, your mind changes. You need parental guidance. Well, you can't wait until your kids are adolescents and in puberty to try to get a hold of them. That's what God gives you the first 10 years for. The first 10 years is for you to get a hold of them children while they're still open and willing to listen to you so that when the hormones hit, then you will already have some kind of relationship. But if you ignore them children, I'm telling you, I wish I had a dollar for every time some mother or some father got mad at their child, but they didn't invest in them. How you going to yell and you weren't there? That is your harvest. You got an out of control child because you didn't get control of them when you had the chance. You got, that's why God gives us that first 10 years. In the first 10 years of your life, you don't want to do anything but be with mom and daddy, be like mom and daddy, and please mom and daddy. Do you know why? God gives us that first 10 years where that young soul is wide open. And if you was busy doing whatever, whatever, then your boy get up, your boy turn the corner in the adolescence, 12, 13, 14. Your girl go from being a little girl to a young woman. She turned the corner, 12, 13, 14. Now you mad at her. Why are you mad at her? You did not parent her. What's she supposed to do? She's never been 14 before. What's she know about being 14? She's trying to figure life out. That's why you have parents. That's why you have a daddy and a mama. What your boy know about being 14? He ain't never been 14 before. All them hormones coursing through his body. He's tall, voice and changed. You know, your, your, just your whole life has changed. Just a few months ago, you was a little man-man. Now you a young man. And, and, and again, parents get all mad. Just start yelling at their kids. 
and you're hurting your self-esteem and you're provoking them to wrath and you're making them angry and you're not helping the situation. You got to do your job. You got to sow. You got to sow into what you want your kids to be. You can't ignore them for 12, 13, 14 years and then think that just automatically, remember I told you, no more genies, that just automatically they're going to turn into these good, godly, responsible, holy people, not without parental input they won't, not without some adult has to sow into their lives. Somebody's got to teach you faith, just like somebody has to teach you how to brush your teeth. Somebody's got to teach you holiness. Somebody's got to teach you self-control. Somebody's got to teach you the choice-consequence relationship. Somebody's got to teach you how to build um, whatever it is you're trying to build. Somebody's got to teach you that. And that's why you have a daddy and a mom. But you can't let your kids go for 15 years and then they look up their freshman in high school and now you don't like the way they're acting and now you're just flying into this rage. I'm sorry, that's not God and that's not the devil. That's your harvest. You didn't invest in them children. Okay? So let's do a quick recap and we're going to close out. So this is number five in my No More Genies teaching. And this is What If I'm Angry With God, part one. And I went through, I think it was five or six reasons. I'm going to give you a quick recap of if you're mad at God, the reasons why you're mad. Okay? Reason number one, if you're mad at God, you're mad at God because he is God and you are not. Okay, and you think life revolves around you, but it doesn't. You're mad at God because everything in creation works the way God wants it to work. It doesn't work the way you think it should work. That's reason number two. Reason number three, you are mad at God because you didn't expect to have to fight. Because you have to fight in this life. You, I'm talking to you. You got to fight. Okay, you expected life to just lay down. Life it just ain't going to lay down because you showed up. You got to fight. Uh, number four, you're mad at God because you didn't expect Satan to hit you so hard. And I read all those scriptures, okay? Satan going to hit you hard. Satan coming after you hard. It's a fiery trial. It ain't no little shake and bake trial, okay? Satan coming after you hard, okay? Number five, you didn't understand that Satan watches marriage because the devil was in the Garden of Eden in the body of the snake watching the first marriage. He watching your marriage. You can't neglect your marriage and think the devil ain't going to jump in it because he will. Okay? And you mad at God about that. Mm -mm. No, no. You ain't supposed to be mad at God about that. God told you how to be married. You just ain't listening. And the devil just waiting. Okay? And uh, next, Satan doesn't care about pregnant women, mothers, or newborn infants. He really doesn't. Okay? The, the devil, if you're a woman or a pregnant woman, or if you have a little child, you got to protect that child. You got to pray over that child. You got to listen to what the Holy Ghost is telling you, because the Holy Ghost might be telling you to move, to leave your city. He told Abraham, move away. He told Jesus and Mary, get up, take the little boy Jesus and move out. Because the devil don't care nothing about children, about pregnant women, about mothers. He'll devour you if you give him a chance. OK, and finally, uh, you might be mad at God because you don't like your harvest because you reaping some corruption that you sow because ain't no devil in them verses. I know we like to blame the devil for everything, but ain't no devil in them last verses I read. You might have sown something and now you got a harvest. So those six reasons are why you might be mad at God. So next time I teach on this, which is going to be a month from now on the next second Thursday, I'm going to show you how to work through each one of those. So if you're mad at God for any of the reasons I listed tonight, next time I teach on this in a month, I'm going to show you how to work through every single thing we talked about tonight so you can get through your anger and so you can get back to faith, so you can get back to victory. Because God does not want you mad at him. But I went over the reasons tonight why so many people are mad at God. It's because of all the stuff that you don't know, that you don't get that he is God and you are not. You don't get that creation works the way he designed it to work. You didn't expect to have to fight. You didn't expect Satan to hit you so hard. You didn't understand that the devil watches marriage. Uh, the devil don't care nothing about women, pregnant women, or babies. And you sowed corruption, but you didn't expect to reap it. So we went over seven principles tonight about why you might be mad at God. So next time I teach, then I'm going to go over how to work through each one of those so we can get back to victory. All right?
Okay, if you have any prayer requests, because right now it's time to release the power of God. Talking doesn't mean anything. We got to let the Holy Ghost move, okay? Thank you. Praise God. All right. Uh, I'm going to talk about that opportunities elsewhere in the broadcast, okay? So it's time to release the power of God. So if you have any prayer requests, please, please put them on the screen right now. My prayer scroll audience, I want to pray that God renew my engagement, all right? Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, for Nessa's engagement, oh God, we ask you to be in that situation, oh God. We ask you to reveal the truth, oh God. If this is what you meant to happen, if this is bone of their bone, flesh of their flesh relationship, if this one is the one, then signify God by the Holy Ghost and let her know she's supposed to get married. If not, oh God, then let her know that too, that this one is not the one, oh God, because you said we're supposed to marry bone of our bones and flesh of our flesh. So if this ain't the right one, oh God, let her know. And if this engagement is not supposed to go through, then oh God, show her the right one to be with and give her confirmation through your word, through the mouths of others, and through your spirit. We thank you for it and we believe you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, God is going to bless you. I need prayer. I got money more than right. Okay. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you for Erica. And we want to release your power. Oh, God. Amen. You're welcome. That uh, you would give her wisdom because the word says if we acknowledge you in all of our ways, you will direct her path. So, right now, oh God, I release the spirit of wisdom on Erica where she can make the decision she needs to make regarding. Uh, student loans and regarding unemployment and regarding her financial situation because there is a definite way she's supposed to go I'm seeing in the spirit as I'm talking to you Erica there's a definite thing that God wants you to do but what you have to do is you're going to have to open your mind a little bigger there's some stuff God is trying to do with you that's higher than where you are right now and God is trying to get your attention to try to bring you up to a new level of thinking and a new level of finances so open your mind and your spirit, Erica, to what the Spirit of God is saying to you so God can lift you up financially to where he wants you to be. We thank you for it, Father, and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So any other prayer requests? You need, you need what prayer also? Oh, the prayer about money? Okay. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for it. And that's again, oh God, that you would give her the wisdom because you said if we acknowledge you in all our ways that you would direct our paths that if any man lacks wisdom let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally so I ask of God for the wisdom for Nessa to make decisions about her student loans and about unemployment oh God that you would show her the financial plan you have for her I see God in spirit you're trying to turn her you're trying to turn her into a new direction that's your answer God's trying to turn you into a new direction so don't fight what the Lord is doing in your life let God have his way. Let him do what he's trying to do in your life. Right now, in Jesus' name, we declare it. Amen. Amen and amen. 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 All right. Okay? Prayer to preach the word like this and discernment for business opportunity, please. All right? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you from a sister of God that you would increase her anointing, oh God, that she would, you would give her a clean heart, oh God, that you would Give her a heart of love for you, a heart of service for you and your kingdom, O oh God, that you would give her a heart of obedience, that she would uh, serve you and obey you because she loves you, and that as she goes forth, O oh God, that you increase her anointing, that you increase her understanding, that you increase her wisdom, O oh God, and let uh, the Spirit of God flow out of her mouth, because it's not about us, O oh God, it's about you. It's not our will, but your will be done, because our way produces death. We want your way, Jesus, so we can walk in life. So let your word be in her mouth as never before and let the fire of God come upon her life to purge her of all carnal things, fleshly things that are not of you. And then, Father, I ask for opportunities for uh, business opportunities and ministry opportunities for her to open up so that you can use her in the boardroom and use her abroad. And OK, I'm seeing that God wants to send you to some very specific people. So you need to go before God and you need to ask God, where do you want me to go and who do you want me to minister to? Because many times God calls us to very specific flocks, very specific places on earth, very specific people. And then he puts the words in our mouth that he wants us to say to those people. So I see in the spirit that God is calling you to a very specific place. So surrender your will, let go of your plans and become open to what God is trying to do, God is trying to send you. That's when the anointing increases. That's when the power of God comes 
when we're in the will of God, because God's power comes to establish and uh, accomplish his purpose. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right? Okay. Let him take full control. That's right. We want to pray for Julian and Ariel. That uh, Okay, Jackie, hold on one second. Uh, Julian and Ariel, they have troubled homes and need prayer for their being. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to pray for uh, Erica's students, Julian and Ariel, God, that right now, even as I'm talking, you let your presence come in that house. And you let your presence come in that room, oh God, because we can know you as children. And I do not accept none of what the devil says because Josiah knew you as a child. Joseph knew you as a teenager. Solomon knew you as a child. Daniel knew you as a child. Oh God, so right now in the name of Jesus, I ask you to reveal yourself to these two young children, oh God, and let them know that you're with them and you love them and you see them and you hear them and you're going to guide them. Even if they're in a troubled situation, you're going to guide them by your word and by your spirit and even through Erica's mouth. Oh, God, you're going to guide them into where you want them to be. And I release that and I establish it on my authority as a prophet in the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for it and believe you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Julian's parents are going to. All right. Amen. God's going to guide them and you. All right. Now, somebody else put something else on the screen. Uh, I saw a prayer request on my Periscope light up, but it went by. So put that back up. I want to be sure and pray for that. Uh, Spurgeon. I think it was Spurgeon. You had a prayer request. If you could put that back up. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Okay, well, if she comes back on, she can put that back up because I definitely want to pray for that. Okay, do we have any other prayer requests? Be sure to put them on the screen and I will uh, be sure to pray for them because it's the power of God that makes a difference. Okay, it's the spirit of God moving. Okay, what's the point of us being Christians if we're just going to operate by our own natural strength. That doesn't make any sense. It's the Holy Ghost. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost operate by the power of the Holy Ghost. We're made in His image. That means we're supposed to operate by the Holy Ghost too. Okay? Okay. Now, hold on. Uh, I'm going to go in the Spirit about physical healing. Yes, there's somebody on my pair uh, and my Facebook. Somebody out there has got some headaches. In the name of Jesus, I release the peace of God to you. I release the healing of God, Jesus Christ, because he took the stripes to heal that headache on Calvary's cross. So by his stripes, you are healed. So in the name of Jesus, I release the peace of God into your head. And what I want you to do is put your hand on your head and say, by his stripes, I am healed. And the peace of God will come through and flood your head and heal those headaches. In the name of Jesus, we cast out confusion and anger unclean spirits of confusion, anger, torment, guilt, schizophrenia, hearing voices. In the name of Jesus, we cast you out. I command you to come out. I command you to break off of whoever I'm talking to in my audience. Break off of their head. Break off of their spirit. You cannot stand before the name of Jesus. The demons are subject to us in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Holy Son of God. So schizophrenia, hearing voices, anger, Shame, guilt, I cast you out right now in Jesus' name, and you will break off. And you can't come back. You can't stay in that house. You can't jump on anybody else in that house. You must go. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you, and it is so. And we stand against all backlash and retaliation because I know you're going to try to go get seven spirits more wicked than you and come back. So in the name of Jesus, we pray down angelic protection. We pray that the angels of God will encamp round about those that are delivered because we do fear God and we are obedient to God. Therefore, they will deliver us and fear us. So we pray that the angels of God, that there be more with us than are with them. And we command those demons that they can't come back and set that ground up, but they must flee. In Jesus' name, we declare it. Amen. Okay, there's somebody else out there. You're on crutches. In the name of Jesus Christ, I speak healing. I speak life into your knees and your thighs, and your ankle bones, and your feet, just like the man received strength in his ankles at the beautiful gate to get up, and just like the man that had been lame for 38 years, took up his bed and walked. In the name of Jesus right now, I speak the quickening power of God into your legs, into your thighs, your knees, your ligaments, your ankles, and your feet, that you might get up. Don't be afraid to get up. God doesn't want you on crutches. God wants you to walk under your own power, 
And the next time people see you, they're going to see you walking under your own power. And when they see you walking under your own power, be sure to give God all the glory. Don't take the credit for yourself as if by your own power you delivered yourself. But it's the name of Jesus Christ and the precious Holy Spirit of God that gives us the power to walk in his blessing and his grace and his healing. Amen. Okay, so that's all I'm seeing on the physical. Okay? All right. Whereas, uh, so let me see if the Holy Ghost has any kind of prophetic word. What the Spirit of God is saying to me to release is to study, to show thyself approved, a workman which needeth not be ashamed, which needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the Spirit of God is saying to us, we need to study the word. We need to get in the word of God and study the word of God and know it for ourselves and hide it in our hearts so we can rightly divide the word of truth, so we can understand what God is saying in the scriptures, and so we don't have to be ashamed as Christians. Amen and amen. All right. Amen and God bless you. Uh, any more prayer requests? Did I miss them? Prayer for healing on my right side abdomen. All right. For Victoria, in the name of Jesus. Okay, Victoria, put your hand on wherever the pain is. And say, in the name of Jesus, by his stripes, I am healed. Yeah, okay, see, I'm seeing it. I'll speak healing all in that abdomen. I see the healing power of God running through your stomach, running through your side. But you have to believe it. You have to believe it. Don't listen to unbelievers that tell you it's magic. It's not magic. you got to believe it. Believe the power of God, because I feel that as I'm talking to you. Believe the power of God is flowing through your abdomen. It's going to heal you all the way around your abdomen. And speak it every day and never let it go. And don't accept the pain when the pain tries to come back. Continue to say, by his stripes, I am healed. And you will walk in divine healing, says the Spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. All right. Anybody else? Uh, no, Jackie, I'm sorry. That's what I wanted to see. What is your prayer request, Jackie? Thank you for coming back on. What is your prayer request? Let me pray for you right now. Jackie Spurgeon on my periscope. What did you, what did you want prayer for? Amen, Victoria. Amen. Okay, just waiting on Jackie. Jackie, go ahead on and put that prayer request. Jackie Spurgeon, go ahead on and put that prayer request on the screen uh, because it ran through kind of fast the first time and I was dealing with some other stuff. Now, remember, I'm on Periscope. I'm on Facebook Live. I'm also on YouTube. So uh, I eventually load these teachings up on, on those three places and also on SoundCloud. So you'll have a chance to review the teaching if you didn't watch it live. Okay, Jackie, I still didn't see. There you go. That God would do a work in my life and family. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you for Jackie, oh God, that you know what this work is. I see that this work is a work of repair and rebuilding. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we speak a spirit of repair and rebuilding. For you release a spirit of reconciliation unto us. You want us to be reconciled to you and reconcile to our family. I release a spirit of forgiveness, and I release a spirit of understanding. Jackie, put your hand on the screen. Whatever you watching me on, put your hand on the screen. I'm going to put my hand on the screen. You'll feel the flow. Okay, so put your hand on the screen. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I release the power of reconciliation. Since I can't be there to touch her hand physically, I'm going to touch her hand through the screen, oh God, and I release the power of reconciliation, forgiveness, and rebuilding into that family situation. In the name of Jesus. Now, Jackie, you're going to see a miracle. You're going to see a refreshing. You're going to see a new spirit being released in that situation. It's going to blow your mind. You won't believe it. Okay? And it's happening right now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. All right? It's the power of God, saints. It's the power of God. And that power comes through the Holy Ghost. Okay? It's the power of God that makes the difference. And I'll say it again. If we're going to live... Amen. You have to trust in God. That's right. If, you, if we're going to live as carnal as normal people, why do we get saved? No, no, no. We're supposed to walk in the power of God's spirit. So to do that, we have to surrender our will. We have to crucify our flesh. We have to say, not my will, but thine be done. So the Holy Ghost can flow through us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You're going to see it, Jackie. You're going to see you. It's going to be such a breath of fresh air in that situation. It's going to blow your mind. Okay? And don't let the devil take that from you because it's happening. It happened right now as soon as we speak it and release it. That's right. You'll see. 
you, you're going to see a new spirit inside of yourself. Okay? God doesn't just work for us. He, he works in us. Amen. God bless you too. You're going to feel a new spirit before you go to bed tonight. You're going to feel a new spirit inside yourself because I feel it as I'm talking to you. There's an anointing that's released inside of you now, and you're going to see it begin to operate in, in your spirit. Amen and amen. All right. God bless you. Uh, we went longer than I thought, but praise God. I want the Holy Ghost, miracle working God. That's right. I want the Holy Ghost to have his way. I uh, pray that God show me the right path in regards to my career. Father, in the name of Jesus, you said that if we acknowledge you in all uh, our ways, you would direct our path. So I ask you to show her the right path according to your will for her career. God is saying to you, my sister, that there is some entrepreneurship in your life. God is not just going to have you working for other people. God wants you to build something. There's a business he wants you to build. So God is saying, spend time with me, get the pattern from me. Let me show you what I want you to build and how I want you to build it. And that's going to be your answer to your financial freedom. That's going to be your answer to going to where you want to go in life. Because there's something God is going to build entrepreneurially through you, and he wants to show you the pattern. So you must spend time with God in prayer to receive that blueprint. Amen and amen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. All right. Amen. So God bless you. So like I said, I'll be on this Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time with my weekly prophetic word. And I'll be on a month from tonight on the next second Thursday to do part two of this teaching. Because tonight we talked about uh, six or seven reasons why we might be mad at God. So next time I teach on this, I'm going to teach on how to work through each one of them so you can move out of your anger with God through any anger you might have with God and get back into faith. And through faith, we get the victory. Through faith, we can win. All right? God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in live. Oh, yeah, that's what I wanted you to say. Uh, uh, that's what I wanted to say. I want you to share this broadcast. So please like wherever you're watching me. If you're watching me on YouTube, if you're watching me on Periscope, if you're watching me on Facebook Live, please like this broadcast. Please leave some comments because that's what makes Facebook promote it. And please share, okay? So this teaching can go around the world because I, I want the Spirit of God to be able to reach everywhere the body of Christ is. Because everywhere the body of Christ is, we want whatever the Holy Ghost is saying, we want to be sure that gets out to the body of Christ. And that's worldwide. So please like this and please share this on Twitter, on Facebook, on Periscope, YouTube, whatever platform you're on, okay? And then again, if you want to support me financially, I have a paypal.me link on my Periscope and on my Facebook Live. You can donate there. And also, I have a Amazon Smile link. So when you purchase on Amazon, a portion of your purchase goes to my Prophet David Taylor not-for-profit. And then eventually I'm going to get my music up too. So thank you. Thank you for your financial support. Thank you for your prayer support. Because I, I'm talking with some people now to rock and go minister out of the country. So uh, I want to be able to go to other places and other lands and let God use me uh, prophetically and use me to minister uh, to other people. Um, because as I say all the time, it's an honor and it's a blessing to be used of God and be part of his kingdom. And I'm just glad that he, you know, sees fit to use my life because it could be so different. It could be so much worse. It could just, you know, so I just praise God. So, yeah, so thank you so much for tuning in. And so I gave you my regular time, so don't forget to like and share. And then if you want to give a donation, that'll be great. And then, you know, I always take pictures wherever I go. You know, I'm going out of the country. I'm going other places to minister. I'll let you know where I am, where your support is allowing me to go. Because I do want to be able to bless other people with the prophetic, with healing, with uh, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, help homeless people get off the street, help people know who to marry, help people know how to get their careers together. All that we learn from the prophetic. So I definitely want to be able to do that in, in as many places as I can. Okay? All right. Thank you. God bless you. Have a good night and have a good rest of your week.